All right, cool. New video, new video time. Everyone's been waiting for it. We're gonna be talking about bosses. Uh, what kind of bosses? I don't know. Oh, of course! Dark Souls 3! What's up guys, Indy Mouse here. We're now up to the third boss video in both my series and the Dark Souls series. And with this title, we have some of the best bosses in the franchise. I feel like From Software really stepped up their game from Dark Souls 3 compared to Dark Souls 2. Do you remember this thing? Jesus Christ. Also keep in mind at this stage there has been no DLC release, so for obvious reasons, there can't be any DLC bosses on this list. So in the future if you're watching this and there's DLC, and you're like, where the hell is this boss? Guess what mate? wasn't released yet, so just keep that in mind. Before we jump into the list, as always, I hit up my Twitter asking them for their opinion, and I can always count on you guys from, for some great responses. Princess tweeted me, Dragon Slayer Armor, Cripple Homos, and Pontivanate. I, <laughs> I had to read that twice, because I, I, I don't know what Cripple Homos is. Is that a boss I missed? At Fishkex? Can you answer me this? I don't understand. What's... Damn it. Mex100 tweets me Cleric Beast. Nice try, guy. I see what you're trying to do here. You're trying to make me talk about the Bloodborne bosses. Uh, wrong game. Um, but you know, good good attempt. I'll give you that. And actually, everyone else's tweets were legitimate. So thanks for all the opinions, uh, the your favorite bosses. I'm sure you'll see most of them on the list here because they are the best bosses and we all can agree. Let's go. I never know how to introduce these lists. <laughs> At the peak of Lothric Castle lies one of the most unique fights in the game. This was a hard list to put together, so the Twin Princes barely made it here into the honorable mention. It was either these guys or the Dragon Slayer armor, because frankly that guy looks like a badass or even an ultra cool motherfucker. <laughs> Jesus Christ, that's good. But I was so disappointed that you couldn't get his gear. But back to the topic at hand, the Twin Princes are made up of Lothric and Lorien. The actual fight starts off with you just facing Lorien by his lonesome. His legs are disabled, so he crawls around on the floor, but his younger brother can help him teleport around, allowing him to appear behind you and fuck you with some pretty strong attacks. His health pull, however, is extremely low, so you can destroy him pretty quickly. And if this was the end of the fight, let's be honest, this wouldn't be on anyone's list anywhere. But of course, similar to a few other Dark Souls 3 bosses, Phase 2 begins, and Lothric, the younger prince, comes down and revives his recently deceased brother. It's said that Lothric was destined to become the Lord of Cinder, and he was cherished even though he was born an ill, frail, and shriveled child. One of the highlights of the fight is the dialogue through the cutscenes. There's not a lot of boss fights that start out with dialogue from your boss telling you that you're just a, another dogged contender, or anything for that matter. As he brings Lorien back to life, he also mentions that he must rise, and that's part of their curse, and that, that line gets me every time. It's, it's so good. In Phase 2, the basic premise of the fight will be the exact same, except the younger prince will be riding on his big brother's back and shooting magic down at you. Kind of reminds me of Donkey Kong, when Diddy Kong's riding his back and shooting his, like, peanut cannon. <laughs> I, I don't know what made me think of that. God damn it. You'll also have two health bars to worry about, but luckily, again, they don't have much of it. This isn't a hard fight by any means. If anything, it might be one of the easiest fights in the game once you've learned it. But a good boss doesn't require it to be frustrating or a really tough fight, in my opinion. This was a unique battle, the way that Lothric continues to revive Lorien throughout the fight until the, you finally kill that younger prince was a great way to fill out the fight without just giving them a giant health bar or something. But all in all, the attacks were pretty easy to dodge once you learned the tells and the voice acting was superb. The Abyss Watchers is an early game fight, and probably one of the first ones a lot of people have an issue with. And don't be that guy, you know the one. 
Oh, I found every boss easy. I never died. <laughs> no one cares. This is another incredibly unique fight in the franchise. The Abyss Watchers continue to rise throughout Phase 1, including ones that actually fight alongside you. They're not friendly by any means. They'll fuck with you as well, but they'll also keep other Watchers busy while you can aim for the main one. The main fight aside, these guys look like they belong in Bloodborne more so than Dark Souls, so I guess I'm talking about a Bloodborne boss here. There you go. They look amazing though. Honestly, I would not be surprised if these were like a leftover fight from Bloodborne or maybe even just a design. His main fighting style is incredibly quick, again reminding me a lot of Bloodborne style fighting. The Abyss Watchers seem to have a heavy tie-in with Artorias as well, who of course was top of my original Dark Souls boss list. Don't go watch it. It's really bad. A cool little touch before you head into the fight itself, you fight these two dark wraiths there which look like they're on the way to the watches as well people speculate that they were headed there to defeat them themselves, which is some cool ass world building if it's true back to the fight itself after you've defeated the main watcher and survived the onslaught of his corpse brethren he'll ignite his sword and it looks like as if he absorbs all the life from the dead watchers in the room and is down onto a one on one fight and in this phase he's a hell of a lot more powerful more violent and has longer range than before but he can also be Backstab, so fuck him, I guess. Why, when I search Dancer at the Boreal Valley art, do I get so much of this? Come on, internet, I had more faith in you than this. The Dancer fights with dual blades infused with both darkness and fire. Similar to someone else a little later on the list, spoilers I guess. She was a daughter of the royal family of Irithal, but was ordered by someone who shall not be named to become a dancer first and then a legionary second, which is basically like being exiled in this world. This is a fight that automatically starts after defeating three of the lords and you'll suddenly be teleported to the arena, or you can just kill old Lady Emma in the church if you want to start the fight really early in the game, which I did not do, mainly because that frightens me a little bit. A really cool touch throughout the fight, her fire sword will light the whole church on fire, which is a really cool way of changing the environment throughout the fight without actually changing the entire arena, which is something you don't really see a lot in boss fights. The fight can actually be pretty challenging because of the size of her sword. <laughs> what was I going to say? I definitely wouldn't recommend dodging backwards out of the sword. You get fucked up by the tip of it. If you found the first phase challenging at all, prepare yourself for the second because it gets a lot tougher. She pulls out her second sword and starts doing a lot of dancing style attacks, like a long spin that you would not be able to block. I found out this was the hard way. It'll stagger you pretty quickly and the rest of it will just dice you up. And because she's a dancer, the way she fights is almost a performance in itself. Even though it does look like she's become a little deformed from the curse, she still elegantly moves around the arena and if you die, at least you got murdered beautifully. Almost like if I came to your house and sliced your jugular. And let you flee down as you scavenge of your life wondering who this weird man inside your house is. And oh boy, would I enjoy that. You die slowly, very slowly. And you know, it'd just be a it'd just be beautiful. Just a beautiful death. So there's a bit of a dual world pattern going on right now, but holy shit was Pontiff Sullivan an intense fight. This was the spoiled boss mentioned in the previous section. He too uses fire and darkness sword in each hand. There's no cutscene as you enter the arena. You just see this large figure standing at the end of the church waiting for you. As you approach, both of his swords light up and he lunges at you, beginning the battle. Pontiff Sullivan is an ally and maybe even dedicated to the cult of Aldrich, who did not make it on the list because frankly, fuck that whole arrow from the sky move. That is some bullshit. Other than that, he's pretty cool. He's using a corpse as a puppet. And that's... that is brutal. Fighting the Pontiff alone is one of the toughest solo fights in the game, mainly because he has so few openings to get attacks in. His attacks are relentless at times and almost feel like they're non-stop. If you can manage to get him into phase two, he'll summon a clone phantom that mimics his own attacks. I ignored this completely, but apparently you can destroy it, only for him to resummon it soon after. I'd probably just suggest to ignore the clone completely and just... To destroy him. Sullivan was the one who imprisoned Gwendolyn in the abandoned cathedral in Anolondo to be fed to Aldrich, and is a self-proclaimed pontiff based on Yoshka's dialogue. He was the one who exiled the dancer mentioned earlier and also gave her two swords, mimicking his own. The Nameless King is an optional boss and easily one of the most badass dudes in the game. I feel like I don't need to explain why this guy's on the list. You fight this fearsome dragon slaying war god from a time of ancient lords above the clouds whilst he rides the back of a wyvern. He's considered by most of the community to be the hardest boss in the game. Once you've slain the King of Storm, the Nameless King will shrug it off and start to face you himself. His weapon is one I still use to this date. 
The Dragon Slayer Sword Spear is probably one of my favorite weapon in any of the games. If you couldn't tell already, I'm a big fan of Dragon Slayer Ornstein and his image is what inspired the whole mascot mask for this channel. So having a less shit version of his spear is amazing. Also after killing him, the storm clears and you find Ornstein's armor nearby, which was a big moment for me. Still one of my favorite sets in the game. The arena you fight the Nameless King in is easily one of the most cinematic or even epic stadiums to fight anyone. Even if the Nameless King was a shitty boss, this fight would still feel like it was important. Which is kind of ironic because it's just an optional boss that doesn't matter. My god. What a way to end the Dark Souls franchise. My favorite thing about the Soul of Cinder is that he's a manifestation of every single person that has linked the fire. Which is why he has all the different movesets that look like classes from previous games. I think Marcus said it best when he said that this end boss seems like an actual human hacker. Of course, like most of the bosses who came before him, he has two phases, and in this second he becomes a lot more like Lord Gwyn from Dark Souls 1. When I heard Gwyn's theme melded into the soundtrack in Phase 2, I legitimately got goosebumps. And that's why he's on the top of the list. No other boss has done that to me personally. I've had holy shit moments like finding Anno Londo again in the third game, but Goosebumps purely from a musical shift is only done by the most climactic endgame fight in a Souls game. I knew this was the end. I knew this was the final fight before it was over. It felt like an endgame boss. It felt like closure of the Souls franchise. And while I didn't want it to end already, it did. And I wasn't disappointed. I should probably talk a little about the fight itself. Apart from the previously mentioned changing forms into different classes, it's nothing new. I don't think it had to be. Actually, his moves are directly ripped from every other class and Gwyn. It didn't make any less of a great battle though. I absolutely can't wait for the DLC. I'm hoping there's a lot of it and it's to the high quality standards of like the Artorius DLC from the first game. And if it is, we're in for some good shit in the future, my friends. Thanks for watching everyone, I do enjoy doing the goof videos like the top 10 Dark Souls stones, but it's also nice to talk about Dark Souls in somewhat seriousness as well at times. It's not a funny game by any means, apart from what the community creates from its content, but it's good that we can do both serious and funny videos for the Souls community and they can enjoy it either way. Thanks again to all my Patreon supporters, if you like my content and want to help me continue doing it, go check it out. Even a small $5 a month can make a huge difference. And until next time, you guys. Have a good one and enjoy my new updated end slate. And honestly, I have a lot more to talk about it with all your guys' suggestions, even the goofy ones like top 10 <laughs> leaf strands or whatever. Whatever you guys have been suggesting, keep doing that because I am writing all these down, so I might get to them in the future. Keep suggesting stupid Dark Souls videos, suggest real ones, suggest everything you can. Um, let's keep, keep it going, people. Yeah.